Testing one, two. Good evening. Good evening to you and welcome to all of you. Welcome to this uh, Sunday at the Abbey uh, presentation. Um, this evening we're fortunate and pleased to have Miss Jessie Bazan uh, as our uh, pre presenter. Uh, and she graduated from Marquette University, a fine Jesuit institution <laughs> to the east of us in May of 2014 with a major in communications. Her campus minister at Marquette was a graduate of SOT. And so uh, encouraged uh, Jesse to come this far west to check this place out. And Jesse was drawn to the, to the campus and, and also to the Benedictine life and community here and hospitality. As a student, I can say firsthand that she was involved in leadership from the get-go in campus ministry on the college campus. Uh, she was actively engaged in SOT student government uh, and, and I think is a genuine community builder. She received her Master's of Divinity degree in May of 2017. Currently, Jesse works as a program associate for the Collegeville Institute. The Institute is working with two very exciting uh, ecumenical grant projects aimed at helping Christians explore their life calling, both as individuals, but also as congregational communities. She also does retreat work with St. John's Abbey uh, Vocations Program. She's a regular columnist for US Catholic. She's written for other publications such as the National Catholic Reporter. At present, she's also working on a book project with other millennial women who met together for a week of learning and discussion with Sister Joan Chittister at Mount St. Benedict Monastery in Erie, Pennsylvania. That would have been in June 2018? Yeah. So, lots of exciting things. The title of Jesse's presentation this evening is Vessel of Voices, The Call of a Spiritual Writer. Please give a warm Collegeville welcome to Jesse. Well, thanks to Abbot John for inviting me to share some thoughts and stories about writing, a practice that's very close to my heart. Writing is the spiritual practice of my vocation, and it's first and foremost a deeply prayerful, personal practice. It's the form in which God and I communicate best and most honestly. But from elementary school on, some of my writing has also been shared publicly in newspapers and magazines online. And so I've come to understand the call of to write publicly on topics of faith as twofold. To share where God is already at work in our communities and to envision a more loving, inclusive, and just world. And this call is inspired by our creator God who in the very beginning used words to create the heavens and the earth and everything in it, right? The story is familiar. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the dry land appear, and it was so. Words can be a tool for creating, for bringing ideas to life. The word became flesh, and words continue to become flesh and inform how we act in good ways and in bad, right? We think about propaganda literature, fake news, these different ways of that writing informs us in bad ways. Or we think about community rules uh, and other ways that, that are more positive for our life. So we can't underestimate the importance of stewarding words well. So this challenges me as a writer then to ask, how do my words become flesh? How does writing about faith inform how I live out my faith and invite others to do the same? So for tonight, our game plan will center around this calling of the spiritual writer. So first, I'll share a little bit about how this call formed in a young writer. I think too often the callings of children can kind of get pushed aside, but that was a really formative time for myself and, and other young writers. And then we'll dive more deeply into the calling itself and the responsibilities it prompts. And then finally, I'll offer a few practices that can help 
spark writing if you're looking to get more into it. So we know that important vocational seeds get planted and begin to sprout in childhood. Uh, so Kathleen uh, Cahalan and other theologians at the Collegeville Institute researched vocation across the lifespan and are adamant that God calls children as they are. And I'm lucky that my mom uh, recognized that at a young age and saved uh, boxes full of my own writing. So it's been fun for this to kind of look back on that. That God calls children as they are. So simple moments of play and learning shouldn't be brushed aside, but rather cherished as insights into who that child is, her gifts, and the ways that God might be inviting her to contribute to the world. And uh, this was the case for me and my writing, thanks in part to being born into a family with excellent writing genes. My grandpa here wrote books on saints and scouts in the city of Milwaukee. My mom, who's here tonight, wrote a doctorate and has had her creative writing published. And then my dad wrote a book on spiritual care for doctors. So writing comes naturally, and I can't take any credit for that. <laughs> Absolutely not. But the particular call of spiritual writing started to form for me in, in 1999 when I had a piece published in the Milwaukee Catholic Herald. It was part of a Catholic Schools Week essay contest where we were asked to explain how our Catholic education would help shape our future. So this uh, winning essay in the first grade category <laughs> read, I believe my Catholic education will help me by teaching me to help other people that are in need. I can teach other people about God. I read Bible stories. I also learn how to pray. I am learning about God, Jesus, and the saints. I am learning how to be a good person. Pretty accurate for how <laughs> life is today. But the lesson learned here uh, at a very early age was that we encounter God in many ways, and we can write about those sacred encounters. And learning that at eight years old was really the foundation for my writing going forward. Okay, secondly, the call of spiritual writing continued into childhood in maybe an unexpected way, and that was through sports writing, which at least in Wisconsin is a pretty sacred, a sacred thing in and of itself. So um, I first learned that writing is a practice in which I can offer a vision for a more inclusive, loving, and just world by writing about sports. So I have two examples, and this first one you'll have to bear with me if you're a Vikings fan. Um, but in January 2004, the Green Bay Packers traveled to Philadelphia to play the Eagles in the NFC Divisional Playoff game. And all was going well. Packers are up three points with a minute and 12 seconds left. Eagles have the ball, and it's fourth and 26 yards with no timeouts to go. Fourth and 26. No timeouts, a minute left. Packers should have it in the bag, right? Wrong, they do not. Eagles quarterback, Donovan McNabb, throws a 28-yard completion, which eventually sets up the game-winning touchdown. Obviously, Packer fans are crushed. Crushed, that was a bad way to lose a game. But they wouldn't get over it. So I'm here in seventh grade, and I listen to sports radio every morning, and for months, people are calling in saying these nasty, nasty things about the players and the defense, and it was absolutely a bad way to lose a game, right? But there's a difference between being, you know, being upset about a play and then being rude and nasty about it. So my 12-year-old self saw this as a justice issue. Uh, so I wrote a letter to, that ended up getting published in the official Packer newspaper and called out the person. Uh, there was a person in particular who was claiming to be a Packer fan who really ragged on the team. So I wrote, in part, diehard Packer fans should forgive and forget. The Packers did all they could against the Eagles, but came up short. Now, seven months later, can we please put fourth and 26 to rest? Okay. So at that, I mean, at a young age, having words published in a national uh, publication was a powerful experience. And the lesson learned here was speak up when injustice occurs, even if it's injustice on the football field. Speak up call it out, and then offer a vision for a more just way forward. And then finally, I was an avid reader of our village newspaper growing up, 
And there were two high schools in the town where I'm from, a large affluent public high school and then the small Catholic Dominican high school. And every week I'd read all about the public school teams, their scores, how their athletes were doing, interviews from their coaches, but rarely could I find anything about Dominican. Again, this didn't seem fair, so I wrote the editor to inquire. And he said that they didn't have enough staff to cover all of the schools in the area, and they had to pick subjects essentially that would bring in more money for the magazine. Uh, so I countered. I said, well, what if I write you an article every week uh, about the Dominican sports? And wrote him a few times, and you don't really say no to a persistent 13-year-old girl, so uh, he agreed. And so every week I'd interview Dominican coaches and players, gather up statistics, write up an article and send it to the editor. And it took a little while for him to eventually uh, get in the paper, but when he realized that I wasn't going away, we had a column. <laughs> And for four years, the small school got its coverage. And this, side note, turned out to be a really cool opportunity. Um, ended up covering the McDonald's High School All-American game. That guy in the red there is Tyler Zellner, who went on to play for University of North Carolina and then in the NBA. So it, just, it opened up some really neat doors for me in sports writing. But what I learned from that experience is that stories don't write themselves, especially stories from the margins. Writing these stories requires taking action, showing up, and persisting. So as a young person, experiences like these helped form my understanding as a young writer of the power and responsibility of writing, especially writing for public consumption. So from childhood to now, I've grown to understand the call to write publicly, again, on topics of faith as twofold. Sharing where God is already at work in our communities and to envision a more loving and just world. Now if we break this down a little further, I think the, the first part is, is pretty straightforward. right? So St. Benedict believes that the divine presence is everywhere. So as spiritual writers, we have this great job of paying attention paying attention to the many, many ways that God shows up all over the place, and then writing about it. Writing what we saw, what we heard, smelled, tasted, felt, in hopes of heightening other people's awareness of God at work around them. Priest and uh, writer Barbara Brown Taylor has this great line. She says, Earth is so thick with divine possibilities that it is a wonder we can walk anywhere without cracking our shins on altars. Ooh, isn't that great? So the spiritual writer is the one who points out those altars in all sorts of places. Right? Being a writer isn't just someone who's published. People write about their experiences of God in Facebook posts and homily notes, at essays, journal entries, all over the place, right? We're writing about our experiences of God. So I'd like to share uh, one example of writing about God's presence that's about this land here in Collegeville. So this is an excerpt from the book that's come out in September with Joan Chittister up there. Uh, the book is organized as a series of letters between Joan and a group of us millennial Catholic women and in this particular letter, I'm writing to Sister Joan about our urgent need to care for creation. So as you listen, uh, see if the scene I'm painting calls to mind any of your experiences of the divine. Dear Joan, Sacraments help me make sense of the world, and I stumble upon thousands of them every day. The created world teems with signs of God's grace, from sanctuaries to state parks, natural elements like water, fire, oil, and wheat help realize the work of the Holy Spirit in the ordinary. I'm particularly drawn to big bodies of water who remind me of my baptismal call. The connection felt especially strong the time I entered into a pre-triduum foot washing with a gracious partner, Lake Sagatagan. 
On Holy Thursday afternoon, I made my way along the tree-lined trail of the local arboretum. It smelled of early spring. Dead leaves crunched beneath my sandals as I stepped further away from the stressors of school and work. We were entering the most sacred days. I needed to ready my body and heart. When I got to a cove nestled just south of the trail, I removed my shoes, the only way to stand on holy ground. I hopped to a rock islanded just off the land. My bare soles landed on the warm, wet granite. Around me, the lake shimmered like it had just been doused with the world's largest tub of glitter. I bent down and, guided by the water's waves, massaged the dirt away from my soles. We worked in tandem, the water and I. It gave of itself freely. I did the same. It's no secret that God reveals God's self all over the place. The first call of the spiritual writer is to share where God is already present. The second part of the call, then, to offer visions for a more inclusive, loving, just world, takes things a step further. So if we believe that the divine presence is everywhere, don't we want everywhere to mirror the divine? So if I experience the peace of God while watching the sunrise, don't I also wish for that peace to be extended to all places? Places like the border, our streets, our mosques, churches, synagogues? We know too well the effects of human sin on our communities. We know the vision Christ offered of a world in which love of God and love of neighbor went out, in which the hungry are fed, the naked are clothed, and all are respected as children of God is far from reality in too many places. And still, it is our common Christian call to support Christ's gospel mission and to make his vision of love and justice a reality. So how do we do that in a broken, needing world? How do we keep from feeling overwhelmed or worse, resigned? The problems are too big. There's too much violence, too much hate. I can't possibly do anything about it. It's, re it's really easy, I think, to fall into that line of thinking. But one way that we can keep from falling into this despair is by envisioning our hope. Hope is a big idea that Christians throw around a lot. But what does hope actually look like here, today? And I think part of this is, is the need to reclaim the spiritual practice of imagination. Really imagining concretely the world that Jesus Christ came to usher in and not holding back because it seems unrealistic. Right? It's not. Our God promises that one day love and justice will be our reality. So imagine. What does the kingdom of God look like? What's the best case scenario? What do you hope for? For yourself? For your community? For the world? And I think once we have those images floating around in our heads of a world that mirrors the divine presence everywhere, then write it down. Say it out loud. Make those hopes explicit, like this man did. I have a dream that. Like Dr. King did so prophetically, we envision the world that we want to see with our words, or sketches, or symbols. And then we try to put our hopes into action. This is the process of the word becoming flesh today. And it's very hard, obviously. Right? A vision that one day will live in a world where people will not be judged by the color of their skin or the content of their character does not come without lots of failure and pain and 10 steps backward for every step forward. Again, it's easy to despair. When we're doing gospel work, flesh is messy. But writing as a spiritual practice helps hold us accountable. It reminds us of our hopes. It gives us space to imagine and dream big. Writing makes the best case scenario real. 
if even just on paper, to start. Right? That's why we write inspirational quotes and tape them to a bathroom mirror. So we see the words and are reminded to live them out. It's why we write out things like job contracts, to-do lists, community rules. So there's written record of what we'll be held accountable for and a roadmap of how to get there. Writing is integral, of course, to one of the most powerful rituals that I've seen in your monastic life, right? the profession of vows. When you go to the altar with vows written out before God and your community, vows of stability in community, conversion through a monastic way of life, and obedience according to the rule of your Holy Father Benedict and the law proper to your congregation, you're writing out a vision for how you promise to live your life individually and as a community. And then I can only imagine comes the hard, messy work of living that out. <laughs> and I would imagine that the effort and ability to put flesh to those words, to bring those words to life, will shape the future of a community in the same way that marriage vows, right, or, or any kind of vows that we take. The ability to live those out matters. So for me, this space to envision a more loving and just world through writing is a real privilege. I take it very seriously in my writing for US Catholic Magazine, and I've been writing for them for about five or six years now. These are some of the topics um, that I've written about in the past. So you'll see a big social justice focus, also an article on uh, Father Nick back there <laughs> a couple years ago. Uh, so I write a lot about current events, um, but always in conversation with scripture, Catholic social teaching, or other theological writings. So the visioning doesn't start from scratch, right? It's rooted in a tradition. So I'll share here an example now from an article I wrote uh, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, after attending the March for Our Lives. It was a demonstration, you may recall, for safer gun laws after the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. And the march happened the Saturday before Palm Sunday. And I invite you to listen as I read this uh, for the ways that the tradition is in conversation with the present and what the vision is that's being put forward. So again, this was an article that was published in US Catholic Magazine. The holiest of weeks began in procession, then and now. At some point, we exchanged dirt roads and donkeys for concrete sidewalks and poster boards, but the ritual remains timeless. Come together, sing out, march. On Saturday morning, I attended the March for Our Lives in Sartell, Minnesota. It was one of hundreds of marches organized around the world to demand freedom from gun violence it felt like a modern version of Jesus' procession into Jerusalem. Crowds gathered, unsure of when the next tragedy would strike, but strengthened by seeking justice together. We waved signs and chanted, Love, not hate, will make America great. A 2018 take on laying down palms and singing Hosanna in the highest. We followed giggling children clad in bright, puffy jackets. Christ, wearing rags and riding a donkey, did not look like your typical leader either. But he marched into Jerusalem anyway, with the threat of violence and suffering looming large. Our young people hop on school buses each day, facing the same threat. How long, O oh Lord? I walked with a handful of palm branches during the march because I can't untangle the sacred from the secular, to take seriously the commissioning at the end of Mass, to go in peace, glorifying the Lord by our lives, is to live a life of faith in the world. We gather in the church building only to be sent out again. Worship and the world should reflect one another. In this light, the timing of the march made perfect sense. We started the season of Lent by marking our foreheads with ashes on February 14th. It was the same day 17 people had their bodies turned to ash when a gunman opened fire at Stoneman Douglas High School. 
The same red we see pooled outside lockers and splattered across desks decorates altar cloths and vestments on Palm Sunday. Students gunned down in classrooms are today's Christ being nailed to the cross. The tears of their parents and teachers fall just like those of the women at the foot of the cross. The parallels could go on. They point to this. Living faith and seeking justice cannot be separated. If, as an Easter people, we truly believe in the hope we will preach on Easter, that Jesus won by rising, that life beats death, and that darkness will never overcome light, then aren't we called to help make this vision a reality? I saw thousands of people witnessing to this hope at this march. It was inspiring. We marched because we have hope that the world can be a more peaceful place. We have hope that our elected leaders will make policies that protect the common good. We have hope that guns and those who shoot them will stop ending innocent lives, suffering, death, and resurrection. Onward we march through the Christian story. I hope from that you might see some efforts to draw from stories of the Christian tradition, Holy Week in this case and to help put them in dialogue with something that happened in the current moment, and using those, that collection of stories to help envision a more peaceful world going forward. Now, to state the obvious, not everyone is a fan of these sorts of articles. Uh, this was fun, going through articles and reading the comments. My favorite one was, her wacko church is off in La La, social justice land, far from Christ. Uh, so people can comment on articles online um, when they're posted, and uh, some of these were from the gun article. Uh, others were from um, a larger piece I did on Catholic social teaching. Um, but yeah, people, you know, free speech at its finest. People can say what they want, and writing about social justice issues um, isn't always uh, what everyone likes or thinks is. Catholic or Christian, but um, I do make an effort to be in dialogue with, again, some scripture, church documents, theologians. This isn't just Jesse spouting off most of the time. Uh, but yeah, people, people can think what they want, and that's okay. So um, lastly, I'll, I'll end with, if you're looking to get into this kind of the spiritual writing, some practices that might help. Uh, and these are probably practices that you're already doing, um, many of you. Every writer's process looks different, of course. Uh, for me, writing is about the process of story collecting. So again, where God is already present, collecting those stories. And story creating, so envisioning that more just, loving world. And these practices I found to be crucial for that. They're not in any particular order, and writing happens in the midst of them, oftentimes accidentally. Um, so I don't do these practices with the goal of producing an article at the end. Uh, these are the practices of my spiritual life. Um, so the, the goal of the practice is to get closer to God. And sometimes insights come up that seem to be worth sharing. Um, and at the end, I would love to hear what practices you might add to this list. So Lexio Divina and Liturgy of the Hours, of course, um, starting the day with these two practices. In doing so, it's been neat being here the last few years and, and getting into Lexio Divina and Liturgy of the Hours, how the stories then of the psalmists and the prophets and Christ himself have become kind of the lens through which I view the world and interpret the other stories around me. So for instance, I uh, had just spent a week doing Lexio Divina with the transfiguration uh, story. And so when I received some difficult news, it was framed in the lens of, what's it like to come down the mountain, like, like Jesus and his friends did, right? And, and that made a big difference in taking in that news that I could connect it with a, a scripture story, with a sacred story from us. So connecting my stories or the stories that I'm seeing with, with those of scripture. Uh, taking long walks and having conversations with loved ones are also really important for writing. The natural world, of course, has so many stories to tell us, so many stories, 
Um, I usually do my best writing while walking, which looks a little weird, but um, most article ideas also then stem from conversations with the trusted friends and family and uh, the, what we create between us. And then two of the most important practices for my spiritual writing have been spending evenings at Pathways for Youth, uh, Center for Youth Experiencing Homelessness in St. Cloud, and then the Miracle League, which is a baseball league for kids with disabilities. Uh, writing is a motivation or accountability check for social action. It's not a replacement for, for it. Um, so I don't think that I could have written, for instance, about gun violence or that march if I had just stayed behind my desk. It, it was important to go, to be part of, to encounter. Um, so going out and being with people on the margins, wherever those margins are, puts real stories to big ideas like human dignity, an option for the poor. So we have all these different practices and all these stories and visions that come with it. And every day there are so many stories to take in. And I titled this presentation, Vessel of Voices, because to me, the call of the spiritual writer feels like being a vessel. And all the stories are like the water, right? So every day I'm getting filled with stories from the psalmist, from family, from friends, from what I read about people on the border, from the youth I'm meeting at Pathways, all these stories, and eventually it starts to overflow, right? And this process of my cup overflowing with wisdom from the world, this is when the best writing happens. This is when the best writing happens, when the stories are, are so rich that there's nowhere else for them to go but out, that they have to be shared. And it really is a lovely process, it, writing. It's uh, a deeply prayerful and spiritual practice. So thank you for inviting me to, to share about it. Any questions? Questions and observations. And Unlike the comments section of U.S. Gothic Magazine, I can actually. It sh should be good. So, two-part question or. What writers have inspired you? And I put it in two parts. Uh, say, older writers and contemporary writers. How's that? OK, great. So uh, Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton. Is that good? How's this? This? Okay. Dorothy Day, because of her uh, the social action, of course, that she took, and actually being with people experiencing poverty, and then the ways that she reflected and wrote about that. Oh, yeah. um, and then Thomas Merton with his deep prayer life, and again, the ways that he reflected on that. It was important. Um, and then as far as current uh, writers, Father Brian Massingale um, and the writing that he's done on racial justice, uh, uh, Kathleen Cahillan uh, and her books on vocation have been really um, important for my own understanding of vocation and calling. Uh, so those are, yeah, those are a few. And then one, one other is Barbara Brown Taylor um, as a, thank you, as a priest and writer uh, and a woman. All three in one, it's possible, and great to see. And so her writing um, has been impactful as well. Learning to Walk in the Darkness by Barbara Brown Taylor was a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse, just, just a, a regret I have is that we're not the same age <laughs> and that you couldn't write when I was growing up in Wisconsin when the Packers would lose. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
I used to pray that they'd win, not that I cared, but I had to live in that state until they could redeem themselves. So, mm -hmm. a regret there. Yes, yes, thank you for that. <laughs> That's good. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this book you're working on with colleagues and Sister Joan, is that Yeah, mm-hmm. Sounds interesting. Yeah. And can you say more? Sure. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I spent the best two weeks of my life in Erie, Pennsylvania last summer um, with a group of women under the age of 35 with master's degrees in theology. So very, very niche, niche group. Um, and we were together for two weeks learning about Benedictine spirituality, um, talking about what it means to be a woman in the church, uh, sharing some of our struggles and our hopes. It was a really wonderful, impactful community time. And at the end of that, uh, we, had, we each had to do some kind of presentation. It, it was kind of a class. Some people were taking it for credit. So we each did some kind of presentation. And about halfway through the time, um, it, it did feel like a Holy Spirit kind of moment because it was a big poke. I was walking down the basement of the Erie Benedictines and something in me said, why don't you ask Joan to write a book together? Oh, she could say no, she probably will say no, but why not ask? So I, my project, I, I wrote up a book proposal for her about um, suggesting that we, we share some of these stories that we'd been sharing together. Uh, really honest stories from young millennial women about Oh, everything from their experience of sexuality to the roles that they can and can't play in the church to their vocation, their family life, uh, just, again, being really honest about their stories and then asking Joan to write letters back to us. So this intergenerational kind of sharing of wisdom is what we hoped to promote. And she was all on board from the beginning, um, and all the, the writers were, so it moved along and... Um, 23rd Publications was eager to publish it, so it'll be out this coming September. And um, I'm really excited to get those, those stories out there. Um, I think that sometimes it's hard to talk about doctrine and dogma in the Catholic Church if you're a progressive young woman at times. But by uh, sharing our stories, that's a way, I think, to, to talk about what we disagree with and maybe not get fired for it. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that book's coming out in September. Nobody else has a question. I talked Don always has Jesse questions. all night long. Full of questions. Um, do you ever write stories about people you don't like or don't agree with? Now, there's a backstory to this, because I, I really like the image of the Vessel of Voices. And one of my favorite books is the Brother, Brothers Karamazov, which has stories. I mean, it's known as being a vessel of voices. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful stories in that is the story of Ivan, where he talks about cruelty and terrible things that happen in the world. And if this is the, what the world that God intends, here's my ticket back. Um, so most of what you've had to say tonight is very upbeat. And there are stories that, that inspire us about good people. But are there stories um, about people who you say, I just don't get why they do this? Mm -hmm. um, or is there, and, and this is another, do you ever self-censor yourself and say, no, I, this isn't right. I'm not, I'm not going to write about this. Yeah, that's probably an area where my vessel could grow. Um, I don't know that I've written a lot about uh, people who I disagree with. I think um, for really up until the last couple months, I've lived in somewhat of a, a, a real censoring of myself out of fear of being condemned by the, like the official Catholic hierarchy. And in my mind, not really even know what, what that meant, but um, I would be afraid that if I spoke out about what I really believed, about something like women and priesthood or LGBTQ issues or things like that, that um, publishing that would then keep me from maybe getting hired in certain places. And so a lot of my, which is true, right? So like that's a real thing. 
Um, so a lot of my writing, up, maybe up until the last couple of months, has been pretty censored. And I think now working for the Collegeville Institute, a real, I feel a little bit more free to say what I believe. But there's also a responsibility, like writing for US Catholic Magazine, they're not going to publish something that's explicitly against church teaching. Um, but I, do, I have tried to find ways to push, push the envelope. Um, so like I wrote, I did write uh, an article a couple, back in August about the clerical abuse crisis. Um, so obviously very much disagree with how the, the institutional church in many ways handled that crisis and uh, continues to mismanage and not put victims first and all of that. And so I did, I called that out and wrote about that. And that got a really positive response, at least from the comment section. What I pulled out in that slide of comments um, was a small, per most of the comments are positive, but the, that was to point out that some, some are a little more negative. But um, so yeah, that clerical abuse article, but that's, this, that's a great question. That's something um, I could push myself as a writer to dive into stories that um, maybe I don't entirely agree with, but are important to share, right? Because the vessel's big and we have to put those stories out there too. Mom, question. <laughs> Uh oh. Um, what's occurring to me the most as I sit in this wonderful place is how much faith based education matters. The sisters, all of you here at this university, faith based education matters big time, as evidenced by your speaker. So, I guess what I want to ask you, Jesse, I, I have seen how the different um, charisms, I guess, of the places where you've gone to school and the people that have founded those places and run those schools uh, are woven together in what you just presented and in, in your life. I, I guess we've never talked about that. I'd like to hear that from your perspective. I mean, I'm seeing you weave together Ignatian spirituality with Benedictine spirituality with having gone to a Dominican high school. So could you comment on, on that? Oh, yeah. Well, and thank you for sending me to those schools. Uh, oh, truly, yes. Um, it's been fun now to have three in the wheelhouse. Um, and all of those religious communities bring different charisms, but are very much in conversation with each other. So uh, was it Gretchen and Father Columba had that great talk a few weeks ago on putting Ignatius and Benedict in dialogue with each other. And you know, they're not all that different, right? This, so I think the idea, between Ignatius and um, Benedictine, this idea of being a contemplative in action has been really important, and that's informed how, again, how I write. So the fact that writing is rooted in prayer and it's rooted in doing service and social justice work and then coming back to reflect on that, those are things that I learned from the Jesuits and bringing it to prayer and Liturgy of the Hours and Lectio Divina, what I learned from the Benedictines. And then preaching about them learning that from the Dominicans, that whether that's preaching verbally, um, which we do in, in certain ways, or preaching through writing, which is a forum in which, as a Catholic laywoman, I can preach through writing. Um, so that's certainly, those three orders um, have very much informed how I write. In all of this, it seems that even from your eight-year-old all the way through life, the call to holiness has been answered as you grow and learn from these, the various circumstances that you, that you have. And I'm grateful to you that you, you, know, you have your views, but you also know how to hold yourself in check so that we still have a chance to learn from you, mm. and 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 in the Catholic U.S. Catholic, I read that all the time, and uh, that would be another area they wouldn't have anything to do with you if you if you really you know, but to hold yourself in check is something special to be able to do, 
and with your wonderful spirit, life-giving ways of, of living with people, of honoring the dignity of all walks of life, uh, we get that from you. Mm. And so thank you. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, another way I'd put that maybe is knowing your audience. Um, so writing for a, a wide range audience, uh, there are certainly articles where I take risks. Um, again, something like clerical abuse, or if I write about priesthood or something, that um, people may have different opinions, or gun violence, right? People have different opinions on that. But um, there's also a way of how do I write so that people can engage it, and maybe learn from it. So if it's super one-sided or the other-sided, people will just, as you're saying, write it off. Um, they won't even read it. And so, that's, again, why I really try to, whether it's site, because I know that what I'm writing can tend to be a little more progressive leaning, I do uh, make a concerted effort to cite scripture, the catechism, which aren't inherently uh, left-leaning, but you know, just citing some sources so that right, someone's maybe able to engage that who otherwise wouldn't. Thank you for speaking. I'm a lay Carmelite, and I see Ignatius ideas in lay Carmelite, too, because St. Teresa of Avila's spiritual director was Ignatian at one point, a Jesuit. Um, how do you write uh, for pro-life issues, helping to stop abortion in our land? Do you do that? So the, the, I think the most pro-life issue that I wrote was this March for Our Lives um, in that, you know, life from conception to natural death, if we're not paying attention to all of that, then I think as a Catholic institution, we're, we're missing out, or as a Catholic writer, right. I'm not doing my job. And so that article, um, and again, calling on, so I've written about Catholic social teaching and the dignity of the human person mm -hmm. um, that I really believe in that if we're not standing up for the whole spectrum of life, then we're not doing it right. Right, true, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jesse, thank you so much. Just an outstanding presentation and conclusion to this series. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, John.